I want to welcome you all to the Discipleship Hour broadcast. Our study today is found in the 10th chapter of 2 Corinthians. If you want to turn there in your Bibles, we're going to put right in at verse 1, chapter 10. Apostle Paul is coming to town, and brother, he is not happy. There is a, uh, a segment of the church that is raised itself up above the knowledge of God, and in fact, the gospel that Paul preached. He's going to deal with this crowd, and brother, he's coming down with supernatural weapons. Well, what kind of supernatural weapons are we talking about? We're going to be looking at that. Many things besides, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer as we get started. Lord God, thank you for the book of 2 Corinthians and the insight into your will that we find therein. We commit the study to you today. We do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When King David was a young lad. He went to uh, give his brothers a little bit of food. The boys were out on the front line with uh, the entire army of Israel. And of course, King Saul was there in his tent and they had a little problem on their hands. Great big guy by the name of Goliath. Everybody was petrified of this man. And Saul, the biggest guy in the whole camp, he was also cowering in his tent. Well, sir, little David, who was a spiritual man, saw that big giant taunting the armies of the living God. And he says, that guy is dead meat. I'm gonna take care of him. And his brother said, what are you talking about? You're just a little shepherd boy. Listen, he said, take me into King Saul. I want to have a word with the king. David went in and Saul said, you're just a lad. He's a giant. He is a professional soldier. You can't deal with him. And David gave his credentials. Yes, he was only 16 or 17 years of age, but he was a shepherd boy that knew how to protect sheep. He said, one time, king, a lion came in, tried to attack my sheep, and I grabbed it by the beard, and I killed it with my sword. And I did the same thing with a bear. I've got great credentials. And you know what? I'm going to deal the same way with that Goliath guy out there, King. King David was a good shepherd. He dealt with sheep, or, or rather wolves. He dealt with, with bears. Anything that would endanger his, his, his sheepfold, David would protect them even give his own life if necessary. And now Apostle Paul, as a good shepherd of the sheep, sees some wolves who have snuck into the church at Corinth and are devouring his lambs. He's coming down. He's going to deal with those false shepherds, with those wolves in sheep's clothing. He's going to deal with them. Look at verse 1 of chapter 10. Apostle Paul speaking. Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence am lowly among you, but being absent, am bold towards you. They said Paul's letters are powerful and weighty, <laughs> but his personal appearance is, is nothing. He's just a short little old guy. I mean, <laughs> he is unimposing. But I beg you that when I am present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some, but think, who think of us as men walking according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. And so these false apostles were saying, who is this little guy? He calls himself an apostle, but he looks like a street guy. He's poorly dressed. He's unimpressive. He's a loudy, lousy speaker. Paul says, I may be that way and look that way, but man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. When King Saul saw that little runt of a man, David, he thought, you've got to be kidding. I can't send this kid out against Goliath. But David had something on his side that Saul didn't, namely God himself. And as Martin Luther said, one man with God is the majority. Now Paul says, verse 4, For the weapons of our warf warfare are not carnal. We don't just have a little old sword. But mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds. When David went out, he was confronted with a sword that was bigger than himself. But Goliath was wielding around. And what did David have? A little slingshot with a couple of little rocks. But you know what? They were guided missiles because God was empowering those stones and he was guiding them. And one shot got old Goliath right between the eyes. And boy, they, the bigger they are, the 
harder they fall, down he came. Paul says, when I come down to Corinth, don't judge me by my appearance. Our weapons are not worldly or carnal. They're mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. Paul says, the pulling down of strongholds and the casting down of arguments and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. They had a lot of bad ideas down at Corinth that the false teachers were perpetrating on the congregation. They were teaching that Jesus was not God in the flesh. They were teaching a gospel message that was contrary to the message that the apostle Paul taught. Paul taught that, taught that salvation was by the grace of God through faith and that we are to believe and trust in the scriptures only. The false teachers were teaching that Jesus was not God in the flesh and that the gospel was not the grace of God alone and there was more than just the scriptures concerning knowing God's will and hearing God. Well, the Apostle Paul says, I'm coming down, and brother, my weapons are not carnal. They're mighty for the pulling down of strongholds. And by the way, the Apostle Paul is alluding to the Roman uh, means of war. In the first century, that wasn't unusual for Paul to do that. The Roman army conquered the whole world, not by accident. It was a powerful army. They had something called a phalanx. And the Jewish army, or not Jewish, I'm sorry, Roman army would go against any enemy of Rome. They would have kind of a V-shaped formation of troops. And every one of these troops would be in a line, all each behind each other. The guy at the pincer at the end of the thing would be fighting, and one's along the side too. And when he got tired, instead of fighting to his death, he would retreat to the back of the line, and they'd put up a fresh soldier at the front. <laughs> and they'd win every battle. The Romans were good at that. And, and by the way, they had great machines to throw boulders against walls, pulling down a stronghold. They could bust down a wall in a heartbeat by these catapults, throwing these huge two, three hundred pound boulders at walls. You throw enough of them, going to bust the wall down. Paul says our weapons are powerful for the pulling down of strongholds. Do you know how difficult it is to change people's thinking? particularly false teachers and people who have been influenced by them, they get set in their ways, brother, all mixed up like cement, and they set. And Paul said, we're going to break it all up. God says, is my word not like a hammer? A hammer breaks up things, breaks up false thinking. <laughs> Apostle Paul's coming down. He's not happy. He's going to deal with this crowd. He's going to deal with them. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments, and every, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the captivity, the obedience of Christ. Paul's got a lot of confidence. And what was the weapon that Paul used? The Bible says in Ephesians, the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. Paul used God's word. It was his only and our only offensive weapons. Paul says we got the helmet of salvation, alluding again to the Roman warfare. We have the breastplate of righteousness, alluding again Roman armor. We have a shield of faith, and we have our feet shod with the gospel of peace, and we got a two-edged sword. It's exactly what the Roman soldiers used, a short, two-edged sword. And when the Lord Jesus was confronted by the devil, after his baptism, he was tempted, and Satan said to him, God has given me all the kingdoms of the world that are in my power, and I can give them to anybody that I want to. And Jesus, why don't you bow down at my feet and worship me? and I'm going to give them to you. And Jesus said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only. Jesus used the sword of the Spirit in confronting the Pharisees with their false doctrines and doctrines of men. He always appealed to the scriptures. He quoted time and time again from the scriptures. The Bible says the word of God is not just like a hammer, it's like a fire. And people before it are like chaff. It's powerful. The Word of God is powerful. It changes people's thinking. It brings them into line with the will of God. Paul's coming down to the Corinthian church. He's going to wield that two-edged sword, the Word of God. 
But before we get to that, I want to show you just exactly how serious the problem actually was. Go ahead a little bit in the scripture, 11th chapter. Listen to this now, verse 1. Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly. And indeed you do bear with me, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, least somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted by the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul says, you know, when I came down to Corinth as a missionary, and I went into the marketplace, into the synagogues, and I preached the, the pure gospel of the grace of God, that's how you folks got saved. And you started a little church, and was, I'm sure it started in somebody's home, and I was your pastor. And you know what? When I gave you the gospel, I was like a, like a minister, like a pastor. I betrothed you to Jesus. Betrothal, well, it was a, it's a Jewish term. It means an engagement, but much stronger than that. It was a binding engagement in the society we live in. You can say, I love you, my dear lady. I want to marry you. I'm going to give you this diamond ring as a token. We're going to get married three months down the road. And she can get sick and tired of looking at you and give you the ring back. And brother, the marriage is off. Not that way in Jewish society. When you were betrothed to somebody, brother, it was binding. You were married. But they don't come together in a sexual union until another ceremony takes place a little yonder down the road. Paul says, I married you to Jesus, but now I'm jealous over you because you've got a boyfriend. I married you to Jesus, and I want to present you to him as a pure virgin, but you've got a boyfriend. You have other interests. What other interests are we talking about? The false teachers were seducing them with false theology and taking him away from their first love, namely Jesus. Being a false teacher is a very serious, serious thing. Listen to Paul. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, least somehow as a serpent deceived Eve, by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know something quite interesting. In 1945, in a prisoner of war camp, Auschwitz was more than a prisoner of war camp, it was a death camp. That's where Hitler sent Jewish people. He had a whole host of camps all across the world, in Poland, Germany, even in Russia. And he was killing Jewish people, six million of them totally, murdered them and put them in the oven and burnt their bodies. And it was just awful. It's called the Holocaust. You all know about that. But were you aware of the fact that in 1945 there were some rabbis and some Jewish elders that got together in Auschwitz? This is no doubt just before they died. And they had a trial. It lasted all night. And who was the one on trial? It was God himself. This has been verified. I'm telling you a true story. They put God on trial. Why? God, if we're your chosen people, how could you have let this calamity overtake us? Look at, we're under Hitler's heel. Our people are dying in mass. This is awful. This is genocide. How, if you are our God and your almighty God, could you allow this to happen? All night long, the trial went on in the morning. The verdict was reached. God was found unanimously guilty of forsaking his people. God was found guilty of forsaking his people. Well, I'd like to ask a few questions. Number one, <clears throat> were there any witnesses for the defense? And the answer is no. There was no witnesses for the defense. And somebody can say, Jack, well, what witness were you possibly talking about for God? Who's going to defend God? I'll tell you who's going to defend God. The Word of God. The Bible says in Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, Moses speaking, if you do not 
obey the voice of the Lord your God. And he likened a relationship unto him as a wife and a husband. Look, I love you. I'm bringing you out of the land of Egypt. I'm giving you your own land, but don't worship idols. Worship me. The first commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Did they do it? No, they worshiped idols. And God judged them, sent them down to Babylon for 70 years, graciously bought them back again judged them over and over again. They wouldn't listen to God. And Deuteronomy 28, bring the witness forward in the trial. The Lord thy God shall scatter you among all the nations. Deuteronomy 28. And there you shall find no rest for your souls. Your life shall hang in doubt before you day and night because you did not love the Lord your God. They were pulled out of the land, 70 AD, scattered among the nations, and exactly as Moses said would happen, would happen. They brought the Holocaust on themselves. And did they not say, when God was on trial one other time, 33 AD, our blood be upon ourselves and our children. When Pilate, the prosecuting attorney said, I find no fault in this man. And Jesus was sent to a cross to die. God already had his trial. He was found innocent, and they still crucified him. They still crucified him. Why would the nation Israel put themselves in this horrible position? Because they listened to false teachers. The same way as the church today listens to false teachers, it brought judgment upon them. God said, listen, here's the word of God, do it. But they listened to false teachers. They had their Talmud, their Mishnah, all their little extra biblical writings that they put up in front of them and studied and read, but neglected the word of God. And Jesus said, you teach us doctrines, the commandments of men, forsaking the commandments of God. That's exactly what they did. And it brought God's judgment on themselves in the Holocaust brought on by their own bad behavior. That's why. God's not guilty. He loved those people. He loves them to the end. By the way, many Jewish people got saved in the prison camps of Europe during the Second World War. Many of them did. Now the Apostle Paul is in the same position. God's people are being misled by the subtlety of Satan. The same way that, that Eve, she was in the garden. What's, what did Satan say to Eve? It caused her to sin. Has God really said that? God said, we can't eat, Eve said, of any tree. We can eat of all the trees, but not that one, not the tree of, of good and evil. And Satan said, has God said that? Has God really said that? Implicating that God was unfair. God was unfair. And we have to cast a doubt on God's word. That's what he did. The false apostles at the city of Corinth are saying, oh, I know that Paul says that Jesus is God in the flesh, but that's a little bit too much to believe. Can't we just believe that maybe he's God's son? Or how about this one? They say that Jesus walked on the water, but come on, that's not scientific. Maybe he was stepping on pieces of ice in Lake Galilee. Or how about this one? Oh, Paul says that Jesus was virgin born, but that's not scientific. Who had ever been virgin born before? We think that it's okay to worship Jesus as God's son, but let's not put all this Jewish mythology into our religion. Oh, they were so sophisticated. Lying, pulling people away from the Lord Jesus and their pure walk with him. Listen to Paul as he continues. For I betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ, but I fear at least somehow as a serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Simplicity, he's the God-man, and we're to live by faith in him, looking to Jesus, trusting in him, and receiving the grace of God in our lives to overcome sin. That's something the false teachers could never tolerate. For if he comes and he preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which we have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. You're putting up with bad theology. 
These apostles are not teaching the Jesus of the Bible. They're teaching a different Jesus. Some are going to say, well, I didn't think there was a different Jesus. Oh, yes, there's many of them. And the different Jesus that America is dealing with, most notably, is the Jesus that was not virgin born. And by the way, when the Apostle Paul came down to this church with the Word of God as his weapon, I can assure you what happened. When he walked through the front door, the vast majority of the church would say, Paul's here, Paul's here, our Father, and they'd go over and embrace him. It would be a wonderful reunion. But then there's a segment of the church, most notably the false apostles, that would stand aloof with a sour look on their face, not at all happy to see Paul. And after Paul had finished greeting the brethren, he had walked over, as a good shepherd would do when he recognizes there's a wolf in the camp, and would deal with that false apostle. That's what Paul did. And he might ask him a few questions like this. And by the way, as a pastor for 25 years, <laughs> I know the way it, it goes down because I've done it myself. <laughs> Paul would walk up to this long-faced legalistic guy, who, by the way, came from Jerusalem, and he might have even spoken to him in Hebrew. And he would say, I understand that you now are the, uh, <clears throat> the ruling elder of this church. And the guy would say, yes, that's true. Would you mind if I asked you a few questions? You know who I am. I'm the Apostle Paul. Well, the guy would say, well, I'm an apostle too, and I'm an apostle of Jesus, so we both have authority here. Could I ask you a few questions about what you believe? Why, of course, go right ahead, Paul. Well, do you believe that Jesus is God in the flesh? Oh, uh, no, 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 I don't believe that. And why don't you believe it? Well, because I heard a voice, and God told me, no, I am not God in the flesh. I am the Son of God. Jesus appeared to me, the false apostle might say. Now, this goes on all the time. <laughs> a, a guy by the name of Brian McLaren, who is the father of the emerging church, he was an ex-Catholic priest, says that Jesus appeared to him. Not the Jesus of the Bible, an angel of light. And this Jesus appeared to him. He spoke to him audibly. And he said, Brian, I've got a new revelation, a wonderful revelation, Brian. Everybody's going to go to heaven. Universalism, whether they're a Buddhist, Jewish, they don't have to be born again. That's just a little part of that old 2,000-year-old book. No, I'm more inclusive than that. No matter who they are, everybody's going to go to heaven. I'm telling you the truth. This is exactly what the man said. He's the father of the emergent church. Now, he has a lot of followers who are pastors of very, very well-attended church like Mars Hill. Rob Bell, and if you'd ask him whether he believed that Jesus was virgin born, he would say, it really doesn't make any difference whether you believe that. And by the way, he heard a voice too. God spoke to him from heaven in an audible voice and said, teach my word. Well, he doesn't teach God's word. He teaches a very perverted form of it. The apostle Paul had the sword of the spirit and talking to that false apostle, he said, okay, you don't believe that God came in the flesh 2,000 years ago? Oh, no, no, we believe that's just Jewish mythology. Then what do you do with the verse Isaiah 9, 6? Unto us a child is born, a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulder, his name shall be called the everlasting Father, the mighty God. Did you get that? His name shall be called the mighty God. And the other Christians who were on the fence, not knowing whether to believe the false apostle or the true apostle Paul, would say, whoa, it's written in the Bible. He is God in the flesh. The sword of the Spirit bringing down all these false teachings. Then Paul might say, have you also not read in the book of Isaiah? I'm going to give you a sign, God says, a virgin, a virgin shall conceive, and she's going to bring forth a, a son. And his name is going to be called Emmanuel, being interpreted God with us. A virgin shall conceive, give birth to a son, whose name should be called Emmanuel, God with us. The sword of the Spirit, powerful. And the church, the real born-again Christians in that fellowship would be rejoicing. Paul's bringing us the truth. This guy's been lying from the pulpit. Devil joins the church, beware. When the devil joins the church, 
beware because he'll always wind up in the pulpit. He's the most dangerous man in the world. He's teaching and misleading God's people. The Lord Jesus said, the way that leads to life is narrow, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you as wolves in sheep's clothing. Beware, my Christian friend. Different Jesus. There's only one Jesus. He was virgin born. He died on the cross to pay for our sins. He was God in the flesh, and he rose again the third day. And trust me, the emergent church does not believe he literally rose from the grave in a body. False teachers, false message, misleading God's people, misleading them. There's a way that seems right to a man. That way, the ways of death, the Bible says. Boy, they just stick to the Bible. And Paul would say, my authority is God's word. The false apostle would say, my authority is the voice of God which I hear. Beware of any man that says he hears the voice of God speaking to him, because the devil's got a loud voice. Let me remind you, Islam, Islamic religion, was started when Mohammed went into a cave, and he says an angel appeared to him and told him, this was a God-given religion. He heard a voice. He saw an angel. The Mormon religion was started when an angel appeared and told that man to begin a brand new religion called Mormonism, a horrible cult that absolutely contradicts God's word on every major point, Joseph Smith. So, false religions begin by hearing voices. Watch out for the guy that hears voices. God speaks to us through his word. It's a sure foundation. The devil lies. And yes, he can talk to you in a supernatural way. Oh, yes. And he does. Don't listen to him. He'll always contradict the word of God. Now Paul says, if one comes with another Jesus, you put up with it. And by the way, if you receive a different spirit, you even put up with that. What do you mean a different spirit? When God's Holy Spirit comes to live inside of your heart, the first thing he does is he bears witness that you are God's son. You've been born into his family. And then he begins to reveal the love and joy and peace of God and begins to free you from your bondage. You become a new creation in Christ. Nothing more wonderful than that. <laughs> I was speaking at a nursing home just this morning, and I was telling those old people, you know, it's an awful thing to wake up in the morning feeling empty. I said, anybody here wake up in the morning feeling empty? And nobody said a word. I know what it's like. I woke up in the morning feeling empty most of my life until I was 28 years of age and I found Jesus. And I have not woken up in the morning feeling empty since. That was a lot of years ago. Jesus came in to live inside of my body. He's there with me. I'm no longer alone. That's what the Holy Spirit does. But this spirit is a different spirit. It is a spirit of demons that deceives people and performs miracles to deceive them. Turn with me over to Revelation, the 13th chapter, and let me share this with you. You might find this quite interesting. I've spoken in a number of churches that weren't really churches, and they couldn't wait to have me step down from the pulpit. Now, I know I can be rather boring sometimes, but not all the time. <laughs> They couldn't wait to have me get down. They were as nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof. They were looking around. They weren't listening to anything I was saying. They couldn't wait until I stepped out of the pulpit because they were like little children eating spinach. And they couldn't wait for their dessert. Well, sir, the dessert came after I walked down and sat down. A prophet got up and started prophesying about things that were going to happen. And by the way, you make one mistake, one mistake. Saying you're speaking for God, you have absolutely pointed out the fact that you are a false prophet. The Bible says pro false prophets are worthy of death. God says, if the thing doesn't come to pass, what they speak, they're not speaking for me. I didn't send them. Don't listen to them. I am astounded by these guys that get up and make all these prophets. Oh, I'm, I'm right most of the time. Well, listen, Gene Dixon was right most of the time, too, and so was Nostradamus, but they were false prophets, false teachers. 
Don't listen to them. Listen to this. And by the way, after they finished with the false prophecies, that's when the miracles all started happening. One guy would get his leg made a little bit longer. The guy that had kind of poor hearing put his hearing aid aside for a while. Oh, they put on quite a show. And then if you're really lucky, the guy might even, the false apostle, might even slay people in the spirit. Oh, they love that stuff. It's entertainment. And when they walk away from the church, they're just as empty as when they came in. It did them, did them no good whatsoever. None. But these false signs are deceptive. They're deceptive. This is a man's credentials. He can't go into the Word of God to show you the truth. He shows you these signs, these wonders, and he hears the voice of God. How are you going to argue with a guy like that? And by the way, he calls himself God's anointed. Don't dare contradict him. Listen to this now. This is during the tribulation period. Jesus said in the last days, there's going to be many false prophets. And they're going to perform great signs, Jesus says, Matthew 24. Signs that are going to be so great, they might even deceive the elect, if possible. Here it is. Then I saw another beast, verse 11, coming up out of the earth. The first beast is the Antichrist, the one who says he's God in the flesh. But now comes his John the Baptist counterfeit. Then I saw another beast coming out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence and causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast. John the Baptist said, there's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. That's the one you want to worship. He's God come in the flesh. This false prophet points to the Antichrist and say, worship him. Under what authority? Can he go to the Word of God and show who this man is? No. Here's his authority. To worship the first beast whose deadly wound was Healed. The way that Jesus rose from the grave after being dead for three days, apparently during the tribulation period, this Antichrist is going to feign some kind of a resurrection. And the world's going to wonder, is this really the, the Christ, the Messiah? I mean, doesn't it say someplace in the Bible that the Messiah would die and rise from the grave? There's going to be some kind of a counterfeit resurrection. And can you imagine how the world is going to say, whoa, he must be the one. Nobody has ever done this except, well, they said Jesus did it 2,000 years ago, but we didn't see that. But we see this, live TV. That's not all. Counterfeit miracles. Listen to this now. He performs great signs, though he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by these signs which was granted for him to do in the sight of the beast. He deceives those who dwell on the earth. Can you imagine this false prophet saying, Oh, I'm going to prove to you that, huh, that me and my pal here are really from God. They're not going to appeal to the scripture. Here it is. Get your cameras ready. Get your cell phones out. And get ready to text this message all around the world. Watch this. I'm going to cause fire to come down from heaven right in the presence of the Messiah. And fire comes down from heaven in his sight. And it's all on camera, documented. And the world says, he's the Messiah. Whatever he says to do, we're going to do it. They're going to fall down and worship an idol for three and a half years. And this is, of course, when all hell breaks loose on this earth. Lying, wonders, deceptive miracles to perpetrate a lie, propagate a lie, to prove a lie. I'm not the slightest bit impressed with the false guys on TV getting up and healing people, and I have no doubt that some of that is absolutely legitimate. I'm not convinced that that comes from God. I know it's not, because his message is not according to God's word. But the apostles... This is their credentials. Here it is. Go on back to 2 Corinthians, 10th chapter. Now, what else do these false apostles preach? Another Jesus, 
that we haven't preached, or a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, a different gospel. Satan's main thrust is to mislead people so that they wind up in a lake of fire, the same place that he is going. And when Jesus said, the way that leads to life is narrow, the way that leads to destruction is broad, the false prophet is like a spiritual policeman. He's pointing to a gate, and he's saying, this is the way to heaven. I can prove it. Watch my miracles. Watch me slay people in the spirit. I hear the voice of God. This is the way to heaven. And do not believe, do not believe the people who believe that old 2,000-year-old book that says that Jesus is the only way. That's much too exclusive. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. No, 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 no. God's not going to exclude other people. He's a loving God. He's going to accept everybody. Broadway. There's the gate. Look, it says heaven. Just keep on doing good. Be sincere. And it helps if you maybe come to our meetings and maybe even speak in tongues once in a while. This is helpful. Follow me. Follow my way. And I can assure you because Jesus told me that you're going to go to heaven. It's a damnable lie. The way that leads to life is narrow and few there be that find it. A different gospel, the gospel of the grace of God is a very simple message. And I'm going to close in sharing it. Jesus, God's Son, God in the flesh, born of a virgin 2,000 years ago, lived for almost 33 years on this planet, doing nothing but good. He presented his legitimate credentials, descendant of Joseph and Mary, both of them go back to King David. He had to be the son of David to be the Messiah from the tribe of Judah. And by the way, he had to perform miracles because the Bible says the Messiah will open the eyes of the blind and the lame will walk. <laughs> Jesus performed thousands of miracles. They were part of his credentials. And so when they sent him to a cross, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. The Bible says he's a lamb slaughtered before the foundation of the earth. He was born to die on that cross to pay for our sin. God needed to settle a debt. We owed him something, and Jesus paid it all. And then after three days, the Lord Jesus rose from the grave. And when we trust in him, the living Christ, the one who's at the right hand of the Father right now, God forgives us for all of our sins and we begin a relationship with Him, knowing Him in a personal way, knowing our sins are washed away and that we're going to spend eternity with Him. That's the good news. Eternal life is a free gift. This is the will of Him who sent me that all that He has given me, I should lose nothing but raise them all up at the last day. Come unto me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, I will give you rest. Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired? Come to Jesus and find rest, find salvation, find a loving relationship that will go on forever. I want to thank you for joining us today. If there's any way that we can help you here at the Discipleship Hour, answer any questions, you can email me at jack at thediscipleshiphour.com. I'll do my very best to answer your questions. Thanks for joining us today, and may the Lord bless you. Until next time.